Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining me this evening. Um, so today we're going to be having a look at an email uh, that uh, on the face of it looks quite good. Um, if I click on it straight away, if I click on it straight away you can read it here. It seems okay. There's nothing wrong with the English. It seems quite formal. Um, the subject line says issues remain outstanding. Okay, fair enough. Looks good to me. No problems with understanding there. And then the body of the email says, um, Jim, following on from the email sent regarding the need to upload the requested financial statements to the virtual data room, the documents remain outstanding and therefore we will be unable to complete the due diligence by the agreed deadline. Kind regards, Simon. Seems okay. Language seems to be on the right side of, uh, at the right level. In other words, it seems appropriately formal. Um, there's no language there which um, is out of place. And it seems to communicate a message. So what's the problem with this email? Well, there are lots of problems with this email. This email fails the four tests that I set out in the original uh, webinar that I did two days ago um, and we'll have a look at this email uh, and compare this email or rather we'll use the four rules that I introduced in the webinar to analyze this email break it down and see um, how we can improve it so let's start off the first rule that we looked at on uh, in the webinar a couple of days ago was the subject line let me just click on there. There we go, the subject line. The subject line says issues remain outstanding. But the problem with this issue, subject line is that it doesn't really tell us anything about what the email is about. The subject line is incredibly vague. It sounds as if it's accurate. It sounds as if it's um, making a good point but it doesn't really tell us anything at all. It tells us one point of the email or one point of the um, one point in terms of the content of the email, but it doesn't tell us anything else. And even that, um, that, that content it's referring to, even that isn't very specific, even that is quite vague. So generally this, uh, in actual fact, the subject line doesn't actually tell us anything at all. And you could read this, uh, you can imagine a situation where you would get this subject line in your email inbox, you get, I don't know, let's say 20 or 30 emails an hour, or you get 20 or 30 emails a day even. And you have a look at this email, the subject line, and it seems as though you should read it, but there's nothing about it that makes you want to go and open up the email, find out what the problem is, and react to the problem. So the subject line is incredibly vague, there's no mention of the VDR, which is the virtual data room. There's no mention of the due diligence. Uh, there's no mention of the agreed deadline. Uh, there's no mention about the, um, the urgency that the email is trying to communicate. So how could we rewrite the subject line in order to communicate as many of those points as we possibly can? Well, what we could say is, well, I've come up with two alternatives, but of course, there are many, there could be other alternatives. You could um, redraft this in a number of different ways. As I said in the webinar a couple of days ago, we'll try to get the subject line under 25 words. And in this case, I think we've got it under um, 10 words, I think, in most cases, in both of these cases. So the first one I thought of was outstanding documents needed for the VDR regarding the due diligence. So it's not an issue that remains outstanding. We now know what is outstanding and that the, and these are documents. So we're being quite specific about what is outstanding, what is needed. And also in this uh, subject line, I've told the person what it's needed for. So it's needed for the VDR, the virtual data room, and it's needed for the due diligence. So if I see this subject line in my email, straight away, I know what the email is about and I can already start to react to it even before I start, uh, before I open up the email and read the content of the email. 
just by looking at that subject line I could talk to someone and say listen did we send this information what's going on here why am I getting this email so instantly you begin to react which is of course uh, a much better situation than sending a vague subject line such as issues remain outstanding uh, the second alternative that I've come up with is um, is a similar kind of thing. Uh, due diligence deadline, and I said it's tomorrow. Uh, due diligence deadline, 23rd of November. Docs still outstanding for the VDR. So here I've communicated uh, all of the same things, that there's a due diligence, that there is a deadline, the time of the deadline, that what is outstanding, in other words, the documents, and what is outstanding, and where I need those documents to be, which is the VDR. So you can see how in very, very few words, you can communicate a lot of information about the body of the email. And remember why we, set, why we send emails, we, or why we write in general. We write in order to communicate, and part of that communication is that there is a reaction of some kind. And that reaction can take a number of different forms, um, but, that, uh, but certainly one reaction is to open up the email to find out exactly what's going on and I can't say that a generic email a very uh, sorry a, a generic subject line or a vague subject line like issues remain outstanding I'm not sure this would get the same response as the two uh, alternatives that I proposed so the f uh, so the first problem with the original email is the subject line the second problem with the email is the salutation, um, a salutation and ending. Here the salutation, as I mentioned in the webinar a couple of days ago, it's pretty questionable. I really don't like this type of opening the emails. Many people don't have a problem with this, many people are quite happy to write this and to receive this. For me, I, it really, really grates, I hate it, why can't you, that I would never write uh, just someone's first name. And secondly, uh, it's a lazy ending, KR. It, show, it tells me that the person doesn't even have the time to write out two words. As I said, these are, this is rather subjective, this is rather personal. Other people might not have a problem with this. Indeed, the corporate culture where you work might say that this is okay. Uh, but for me, this is something that really winds me up. So how could we change this? Simply, dear Jim, hi Jim, suddenly for me the tone of the email changes straight away. And instead of saying KR or BR, we could actually write kind regards or best regards. It, how difficult is it to do that? And then straight away, uh, and then at the end, I'm left with a much better impression of the email than KR or BR, which, as I said to me, suggests rather a lazy approach to writing. So the subject line was wrong. And then the salutation and the ending was wrong, in my opinion. Let's have a look at the big two now. The first of the biggish, the first of the big points is why are you writing? Why are you write an email to communicate to someone for a particular person, a purpose? You want them to know what it is you're writing about. And if we have a look at the um, original email. It's very vague or imprecise in the reason why the email is being uh, written. It says, following from the email sent regarding the need to upload the requested financial statements to the virtual data room. So what I'm doing here is I'm talking about another email. I haven't identified when the email was sent, um, which would have been might have been helpful. And so the, f the first part of the sentence is about another email. And then I'm now saying the documents which I referred to in that email are outstanding and as a result of that we are unable or we will be unable to complete the due diligence by the agreed deadline. There's no obvious reason why I'm writing this email. What I'm doing here is I'm kind of just setting out the facts as it were um, and that's a pretty lazy way to communicate it's a, and it's not a good way to communicate if you want to get a result or a reaction of some kind. There are no humans here. 
There's no me, you, there's no um, our team, there's no uh, our company, your company. There's So if we don't have humans in the sentence, it makes the whole sentence rather abstract. And that also um, creates a certain amount of um, ambiguity or vagueness about the whole situation. Everything is in one long sentence. We've got a sentence here of around about 30 words and we're communicating everything in th uh, 30 words. So everything is put together and it's really difficult to focus on the main points. So you, you get one of these, um, you'll get a sentence like this, you'll get some writing like this where there's lots of information in one sentence and this is called uh, over particularization. And you read the sentence and you think, uh, What's going on here? There's something that's being said, but I really don't know what the main point is. What is the main point? Uh, and it could be redrafted in a way where those main points are being expressly communicated. And we can do that quite simply. We can start off with some um, really simple but formal ways to start the email. I'm writing to let you know that. I'm writing to inform you that. I'm writing to make you aware that. So clear beginning. Why am I writing this email? And then I've highlighted the two points that I haven't received all of the, document, uh, the documents to the VDR and as a result I'm unable to complete the due diligence. So we could redraft this and we'll see um, my entire redrafted email in a few moments. We can redraft this in a much clearer, much more obvious way so then the person reads the email and can react precisely and exactly in the way that you want uh, the reader to react. So we've got problems here with the, the main reason why we're writing. And the fourth rule is what do you want to happen? In this original email there's no clear indication. There's no I want this to happen. It's uh, very much a situation of this is the situation, this is the statement of fact, now do something with it. Which is a pretty lazy way and a pretty ineffective way to communicate and indeed if the aim of this email is for me to react and send you the financial statements, uh, I could quite easily argue you didn't tell me to send the statements because there's no question here. Sure, I could imply something. Of course, anyone could imply something. It doesn't mean that they're correct, but there's no obvious question here. There's no obvious call to action. And the fact that there are no humans mentioned in this, no organizations, also makes this quite, uh, quite difficult to work out. So what we've got here is text which implies a question. Well, that's not much good. So what we have to do is here, we have to make that question uh, explicit, we have to make that question um, in a proper way, or we have to create, um, write the question in a proper way, and of course we can do that by using indirect question forms. So, could you please send? Could you please contact me? And of course we have to include the ending which is um, kind, of, kind of like a boilerplate clause. Um, and there is some criticism of boilerplate clauses but it's an important element of anything that you write to say if you have any questions or if you have any queries, any comments, if you have any feedback get in contact with me and I'll help you out. So that last sentence is more of an, uh, an offer of assistance if someone needs some help and as a result it covers your back it protects you because if you just write an email and you don't include the ending then um, it could be argued that you didn't offer appropriate assistance, that you didn't make yourself available, uh, that you didn't write in a particularly client friendly way and so on so on. So you can quickly avoid all of those issues by just saying if you've got any questions then get in contact. So there's four, re four main re uh, ways in which the original email failed. It failed on the subject line, it failed on the salutation and ending, it failed on the reason why we're writing the email, and it failed on what we want to happen. So even though it looks wonderful, lots of big words, sounds very formal, complicated structure, one long sentence, is actually 
not very good at all. And this is a perfect example in, in the previous, in the explanatory videos that I do for various different points. I uh, often say that um, lawyers come up to me and say that this language is very sophisticated uh, and it's uh, very sophisticated and I want to write like this um, and sometimes people say it's very sophisticated and I have difficulty understanding this and I learned to hate the word sophisticated because sophisticated didn't mean anything positive for me it meant something entirely negative and someone might think that this email is sophisticated it's really not it's a very badly drafted email so how can we redraft this? Well, there are, of course, a number of ways that you can redraft this. There is no one correct answer. So this is my suggested correction. So we started off with our uh, subject line, um, due diligence deadline, 23rd uh, tomorrow, docs still outstanding for the VDR. Communicate the message. Tell the person what the email is about straight away. Dear Jim, personal preference this one, but I think it looks good. I'm writing to let you know that we haven't received the financial documents we requested in our last email. So I'm telling them what's going on and I'm telling you when the email was sent. Now I could be more specific. I could say our email of um, let's say the 19th of November or the 15th of November or uh, on Friday for example. I could be more specific and there would be nothing wrong with that. In fact it might even be a bit better. So that's why I'm writing. And now I'm going on to the reasons why this is important. If we don't receive these documents, we will be unable to complete the due diligence by the agreed deadline. So here I've communicated the two main points that the original email doesn't communicate. And also I've included human beings. And this is important because that means there are relationships and uh, in terms of what I expect from you and what I hope that uh, for you to give me. And in fact, this also helps the situation where if the person didn't get the email or I'm talking to a different person, then the identification of humans means that there are contact points. So, I, so let's just say Jim is ill or Jim is on holiday. And then someone could get contact with me because I've identified myself. And they would say, listen, Simon, um, I didn't get this. Tell me about this quickly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So identifying humans using the active voice is uh, very, very beneficial from the point of view of communication and identifying people to communicate with. And then I finish off with a call to action. Could you please send the documents to the VDR as soon as possible? It's indirect. It's polite. It's formal, it achieves my goal. There is no way that this question can be misunderstood and the, the uh, result of reading this question is that you should generate an action, as I've said here, as soon as possible. And then an ending. If you have any questions regarding the above, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Kind regards. And then I can finish it off with Simon. So... In my opinion, the redrafted email, and, I, and as, as I said, there are other ways that you can redraft this. We can use other structures. This is not the answer. This is just one of many potential answers. Uh, is a lot better. Active voice, humans, short sentences. The points are clearly identified. And what I've also done here is I've introduced a little bit of what we call white space. Now, white space is are the gaps between words or gaps between paragraphs and I deliberately left a gap between the first paragraph and the second paragraph and I did that on purpose to separate the two different issues so the or the two different uh, parts of the email the first part is why I'm writing and the consequences of the action and then I separated this to make the second part more visible and then I put in that second part, the, uh, my call to action, what I want from you in the email. So careful use of white space is also very, very good for breaking up information, making it easier to read and making it easier to process as well. So there we go. 
Um, it seemed like uh, quite. It seemed like originally a good email. It really isn't. Uh, I've destroyed it as best as I can. Um, and even though the uh, the redrafted email seems easy, it takes quite a lot of experience and a fair bit of practice to do this. Which is why, uh, first of all, it's important to try. But it's also important to uh, read, reread, redraft, and then uh, and then send the second or the third draft. So, if you have any questions at all, uh, if you agree or disagree with anything that I've said, please leave a comment uh, with the video or contact me through my Facebook page or YouTube channel, and I'm happy to have that discussion with you. Um, and I'll see you again next week with another webinar. Good night now.